Okay. So I'm glad you're back. And what I'd like to explore with you is the topic of love and power. And it's part of the series that I'm doing on how to live together, which seems like a very timely topic. Uh, it's a perennial topic in our relationships, uh, whether with friends, families, neighbors, coworkers, bosses, <laughs> people we supervise, everybody. How do we live together? And also, how do we live together politically or uh, more broadly um, in, at a time in which there's a lot of turbulence in that area? How do we actually do that? So that's what I hope to explore with you here. And last week I explored what I called one and two, joining and separating in our relationships, particularly significant, important relationships. And tonight I'd like to explore another deep, universal, nearly universal theme in our relationships, love and power. So first off, love seems obvious especially when you kind of take it in its full spectrum, including things like uh, just simple compassion or uh, concern for others, goodwill toward others, friendliness, kindness, uh, loyalty to them, commitment to social justice, broad commitments to the welfare of others, and of course, passionate, cherishing, maybe of a particular person or a small number of people that you deeply, deeply care about. Love seems pretty obvious, right? Including the dimension that ranges from lots and lots of love of the various kinds I mentioned there, all the way down to very little or none at all. Love seems pretty relevant to relationships. But power, hmm, sometimes it could seem like a taboo to sort of name it, both when you are exercising it yourself and when someone else is exercising it toward you. Uh, as a determined, prickly, autonomous, <laughs> uh, independent kind of kid who was under the thumb of a lot of power assertion from two loving and decent and traditional kind of parents who themselves had grown up uh, in, during the Depression in America and experienced a pretty power-centered upbringing, um, you know, power was, very, I was very aware of power. And I remember um, having my first meeting with one of my three primary mentors at UCLA. And I entered UCLA pretty young. I was 16. I turned 17 late in October. And as a shy, unpopular, kind of dorky kid, I had the chutzpah to run for president of my dormitory, which was kind of a big deal. 800 people, some real money involved as a budget. And Lo and behold, somehow I won. So now I'm 17. What am I going to do? And I had a meeting that summer with Carol Hetrick, who uh, seemed like a vastly older woman. She was probably about 24. And she was the assistant dean of our dormitory and just a wonderful, wise being. So I remember walking into her office uh, with kind of the defensiveness of a 17-year-old who really wasn't very sure of himself. And after the initial, hello, hello, I just came right out with it. I said, so what power do you have over us? And I think in a certain kind of way, I, I watched her blink. I watched her be startled. She stepped back and then she smiled and it was like, all right, kid, game on. <laughs> you know, you asked, <laughs> now we're going to talk about it. And it was very cool, actually. I mean, she kind of got that I wanted to know what the parameters were. And as the assistant dean, she had quite a lot of power over student government in the dormitory. This was back in 1970. So, you know, things have shifted somewhat over the years. Um, but the university had a lot of power. So we just kind of acknowledged it. And then we understood where basically we had some freedom of action as student government or the territory where we needed to keep her in the loop, but we could decide for ourselves or the territory where uh, she and we would collaboratively decide. And then there was the territory where, if, whether we liked it or not, she would exercise power if need be. But we sorted that out. But it was kind of a taboo to mention it initially. And it was so useful to get past the taboo and just tell the truth. Where do you have power? Where do we have power? What, what are the boundaries here? How do we work this out? Then I'll tell you another little story here. My dissertation was on 15-month-old toddlers. 
uh, and their parents, in this case, to kind of simplify the variables, they were mothers of um, 10 little boys and 10 little girls, as best we understood their gender identity at the time, and these 20 mother-infant dyads, mother-toddler dyads, I went in their homes and videotaped interactions and constructed settings in which there would be interactions, in which there was a collision of wants. There was a power struggle. Kid wanted one thing that mother wasn't so sure about. And then what happened? And the thing I was especially interested in is what happened when the parents used um, a form of gratifying or rewarding power by offering alternatives that would honor the general direction of the child's wants, maybe which were problematic. They wanted to play with the sharp steak knives, but instead would redirect the child or offer an alternative to, let's say, the cool spoons that were jingling and jangling and full of colors, uh, offering alternatives, in other words, and then observed what happened. And in the research um, at the time, could well be true these days, when researchers would go into the homes of you know a large population of parents with their young children, generally speaking, the researchers observed that on average, parents exercised power. They either thwarted the wish of the child or ignored it. Roughly, and of all the times they did, did that, by any sort of reasonable standard, they didn't need to do it on average about half the time. And in young childhood, these so-called control episodes in which there's a collision of wants and the parent exercising power over the toddler, appropriately or inappropriately, averaged about 20 times an hour. So imagine what it's like. You can imagine as an adult and imagine as a kid, you know, every three minutes on average, uh, your parent is exercising power over what you want. And usually to not give it to you or uh, turn you away from it or even punish you for pursuing that or wanting that or even asking for it. Whoa, that has a lot of effect, doesn't it? So a lot of power, a lot of power in early relationships. We grew up with power. Uh, parents need to have power uh, in order to fulfill their responsibilities toward their children. If we make people responsible for this much, but give them only this much power to fulfill that responsibility, that will drive them crazy. A lot of research on that, and that's something to really think about. If there's a how can I put it? If a person has this much power, but only this much responsibility, that's a lot of missed opportunity to use that power for good. On the other hand, if a person has this much responsibility, but that much power, that will create a lot of suffering and harm for them. Uh, and so if you are in situations in which you have this much responsibility, or you feel you have this much responsibility, like for the care of an aging parent, or in your, or for the welfare of another person. But in fact, you only have this much power, really, to influence the outcomes there. Um, that's something to really look at and to do what you can, most likely, to either expand your sphere of influence or shrink your sphere of responsibility. Because when there's a significant mismatch between the two, that's just a setup for a lot of suffering and often disaster. So, power. A lot of power, and I'm encouraging mindfulness of it here. I mean, groups exercise power when they invite or exclude new members, and people exercise power when they kind of push their way uh, into a group. Um, assertions of power, including subtle forms of influence or persuasion, per pervade, pervade our relationships. They're everywhere. Setting the agenda. Who sets the agenda? That's an assertion of power. Who convenes the meeting? who starts the conversation, who controls the topic, who determines the topic, who can return people back to the topic. That's an assertion of power. And again, it's not necessarily bad. It could be really virtuous, really beneficial, and power is in the mix there. How about interrupting? That's a real assertion of power. Who gets to interrupt? Studies show, you know, typically uh, men interrupt women much more than women interrupt men. On average, I'm sure there's some exceptions. Maybe it's setting dependent to some extent, but that's an assertion of power and something to pay a lot of attention to if you, you're a man like me. Uh, criticizing, uh, being the knower, being the one who is right, 
being the teacher, being the more evolved person in the dynamic rip, creates an asymmetry of power um, in the relationship. Uh, power is a factor uh, when we take steps to reduce our own power or to increase the power of others. It's not bad, could be very benevolent, power's on the table there. Um, or power's on the table in times when we seek to equalize power. There too, forms of cooperation in which they're collaborative and egalitarian. Um, power is a dimension there through its absence, including through its maybe deliberate absence. Power is implicit also whenever there's a difference of, so, of social power or status, pardon me, social status or privilege or authority. For example, to name it, there's a differential of power here. I'm the designated teacher. I have a certain role. I'm the host of the Zoom meeting. I share that function with others in our stewards group, like tonight in particular art. Um, but there's a difference there, right? We can try to hide it, you know, we could try to dress it up or otherwise slap lipstick on the pig, but you know, power, power is there, power is there. So let's just pause here and four questions that can become experiential and I warn you, can stir stuff up for you. So be easy with yourself here and you can come back to these questions later I'm not going to be able to spend a lot of time with any single one of them, but I want to put them on the table for categories here about power and considering yourself in your own life history. So first, how have you exercised power in some of the many forms that I've named so far, including subtle, everyday, perfectly fine uh, forms? How have you exercised power in ways that feel beneficial? to you and to others. Maybe times that you asserted yourself, even on behalf of others, and it felt right. Even if you did your best, but did not prevail. Still, you asserted, you exercised power. Just kind of relax and reflect about other times you exercised power yourself in ways that felt beneficial, such as standing with others for justice. That's an expression of power. I remember um, a kid in school who was an outcast kid. I was maybe fifth or sixth grade. And unfortunately, as big primates, dominance hierarchies, are really common, uh, including in fifth grade. And he invited me to his birthday party. And I risked my own marginal social standing as a quiet, shy, you know, nerdy kid. Um, but I went to his party and I just remember his mother just being so grateful that he had one friend. He had one friend at his party. And so I, in my way, exercised power, and I feel to this day regretful that I didn't have the courage to exercise even more power by being more visibly sociable with him on the playground or in the classroom. Uh, power. Um, you might think about times you disengaged from others who were trying to draw you into things that you didn't feel good about. Maybe you walked away from certain groups of friends that you just felt were not right, even though they kept trying to pull you back. Um, maybe your parents wanted you to go into a certain occupation that just wasn't right for you. Maybe it was traditional in your culture, but you just walked a different road. That's an exercise of power. All right. So that's the first question. Uh, how have you exercised power or how do you currently assert yourself in various ways that feel right to you? Okay. Second question, how have others in your life exercised power over you in ways that were beneficial? Uh, perhaps you had parents who kept you out of trouble even though you were heading in that direction and protested at the time. 
they knew better that, you know, uh, you got, you don't ride in the car with that person because they're drunk half the time, <laughs> you know, they're driving or something, you know, or maybe your parents really nudged you. They made you keep playing the piano. And, you know, looking back, you're really glad they did. Uh, you know, maybe you can look back and you can see that parents or others really tried to influence you to do something wise on your own behalf. And maybe it took many, many years for the, to sink in. Like I can think of examples like that with my own parents, including things like, start saving money when you're young, Rick. <laughs> For me, young was mid fifties, but anyway, um, you know, or maybe you were in settings that were pretty regimented, like a meditation retreat, or a monastic setting, or a sports team that were pretty regimented, and you kind of grumbled or balked, or it bothered you at the time. But you know, looking back, there was the, the discipline of it, the regimentation of it, was a factor in it being beneficial to you. Okay. Third question, how have others exercised power over you that were or still are harmful? Here's especially where we can start getting triggered. So kind of a warning here. You know, the range of others exercising harmful power over other people, you know, goes from subtle forms of intimidation, rejection, um, exclusion, all the way out to the full horror show uh, in human history at all kinds of scales. And just being aware of that dimension in your life and the suffering it's brought to you and how it's shaped you. And frankly, how today you can be wise about it. How today, on the basis of being mindful, of how power came at you or is currently coming at you in harmful ways, how can you be wise about it in various ways? How can you, in the present, do what you can to not um, be dominated in those harmful ways? Uh, in the present, to practice in skillful ways, including getting on your own side, powering up, <laughs> for yourself as best you can, at least inside your own mind, things like that, as best you can, enlisting others, enlisting allies as best you can. And then looking back at the ways in which you've been affected by power coming at you, how can you be wise about that today? For example, in my case, uh, who had, for all kinds of reasons, including the privilege or the advantages of, you know, being born into a kind of middle, middle-class family, white, suburban American um, in the early 1950s, uh, still a fair amount of power came at me that I rebelled against excessively. And I became, became then excessively prickly about any form of influence or advice coming at me and kind of balked at it and pushed it away unwisely. And I've tried to help myself as an, you know, late adult uh, become more comfortable with, you know, the assertion of power by others, which is not inherently problematic, you know, in, instead of my reactivity coming out of my teen years and then early adulthood, in which I would get reflexively reactive to any assertion of power from others toward me, even if it wasn't actually a problem or even if it was actually helpful to me. So th that's been a path of my own wisdom about it. There are other forms of this, of course. If you have had um, power asserted against you that was harmful, one kind of wisdom is to you know, be very careful about blaming yourself for that or feeling bad that you were, I'm going to use a potentially loaded word, truly the victim there. There's no shame inherently in being a victim if you were victimized by power that you, that was, you were outnumbered or overwhelmed or overpowered by something. And you know maybe you've been hard on yourself about that, or you could go back and look at that and 
respect yourself for the ways that you survived all that, came through it in some ways, still here. There might be aspects of this that would be wise for you to re reflect on how harmful power came at you. Yeah. And then last, gulp. Um, how might you have exercised power over others in ways that may have harmed them? And this can bring up uh, some shame, some remorse, some regret. I have my own uh, about all kinds of things, little moments with other kids when I was physically dominating um, and inappropriately, like as a seventh grader goofing around with friends and that friend, I lost that friend afterward. Or, you know, as a parent, uh, being stressed, pressured, getting irritated, exasperated, you know, um, being intense in ways that I regret to, to this day, uh, you know. So you might, and there are other forms of that. Uh, so you might look at that, you know. This is the fourth category. How might we have exercised power over others or are currently in ways that are problematic? And there's a lot we can do to see this clearly and do what we can to repair or heal uh, and move to a genuine and healthy forgiveness of yourself that's healthy and genuine. And Forrest and I wrote about this in one of the best parts, of, I think, of our book, Resilient, in the last chapter on generosity, including the generosity, the giving of forgiving, forgiving others and forgiving yourself. It's too much about the topic of self-forgiveness that we can explore tonight, but I just want to name that there are healthy ways to acknowledge the harms that we have done or are doing to others, regulating ourselves about it if it's happening in the present, and um, healing and repairing, including only inside ourselves, if that's all we can do, <laughs> about things that happened in the past. So it should be clear, I hope by now, that power is real. Power is a significant dimension in most relationships. <coughs> How might it relate to love? So I want to draw here on the work of Diana Baumrind. I think she's no longer alive, bless her memory, a wonderful academic. I got to know her a little bit at UC Berkeley, a professor there. And she developed this model related to parenting initially, uh, and then we can broaden it. So imagine four combinations of high and low power combined with high and low love. So I'll just kind of walk through them and then consider the implications for you in your life. So first we have low power, low love. And in terms of you, now you can turn it around and you can think about this from the perspective of the other person. Well, let's keep this centered in terms of your perspective. So. You're in a situation in which you have low power and low love. Now, there are many everyday examples of this. Just passing by, strangers in the street, wandering by. We're not trying to harm them in any way, but we're not trying to help them in any way. Low power, low engagement, low love, right? Um, now, in certain kinds of relationships, that sense of low power and low love isn't just um, fine, natural, of course, but hmm. Maybe it kind of indicates a quality of apathy or negligence in the relationship that might prompt some inquiry, some questioning. Hmm, is there something I could do about that? All right. Then we have high power combined with low love. This is what Diana Baumrin called authoritarian parenting, or more broadly, authoritarianism. Think about a dictator classic Game of Thrones power structure for the last 10,000 years, hierarchy in which you know concentrations of wealth and power have a lot of power, have a lot of influence, sometimes justified in quotes by various religious structures that is casually exercised over the many, the few exercising power over the many without regard really much at all for the welfare of the many. That's high power and low love uncaring dominance, exiling, casting out, externalizing costs on others, dumping consequences of uh, choices onto others who can't do anything about it, ranging from dumping carbon in the sky that our 
grandchildren and children and us today can't do anything about once it's up in the sky, as far as we know, or other forms of externalizing costs on others. You know, just moving through the land, uh, pillaging it, and for personal profit and leaving wastelands, uh, ruined ecosystems behind. That's an example of high power and low love. Um, prejudice against lower status people, structural systemic forms of prejudice against lower status people. Um, you know, that's an expression of high power and low love. Now, how about low power and high love? That's a nurturing egalitarian relationships. All right, many examples of that. Low power, high love. Great. And sometimes low power and high love is compassion without clout, caring without the power to do much to relieve suffering. And sometimes that's just the way it is. High, high power, I mean, high love, lots of compassion, little capacity or no capacity to do anything about it. On the other hand, as I'll get to in a moment, when there's high love and low power to make anything better for someone, there's little influence, uh, then there's sometimes a question, how can one, how can you, how can I grow the power that can actually implement the lovingness in ways that are helpful to those we love? And I'm using the word love really broadly here. And then we have high power and high love. Diana Baumrand um, called this authoritative parenting. It's hard to keep in mind. Authoritarian and authoritative, right? Authoritarian is high power, low love. Authoritar authoritative is high power, high love, all right? Uh, caring combined with the capacity to open doors for someone or to appropriately exercise power over them for their welfare, like a parent who recognizes that they need to grab their kid and exercise power to pull them back from an onrushing bus or to tell them, no, I know you're a teenager. I know you really need your freedom. I totally support that. I'm not trying to control you, but I need to know where you are on a Saturday night. And by allowing me to exercise that kind of power, I can step back and have room for you to exercise power over who you're hanging out with. I just need to know where you are. For example, um, on the other hand, sometimes high power and high love comes with over monitoring, over controlling, over pushing, helicoptering, dominating, um, include whether it's our children or other people, because we care so much about them, but we go too far. I can certainly think of examples of that in my own parenting. Um, so finishing up, you might think about your relationships and different aspects of them in terms of these four combinations. In particular, you might consider how you might bring the dimension of love, compassion, goodwill, openness, which was our topic in meditation, an open heart, a simple, open-hearted, receptive presence is tremendously powerful and also loving in the broadest sense in our relationships. What does it feel like when we're with someone who has an open-hearted presence with us. Wow, All right? So that's, that's an opportunity there, maybe, in general, increasing the dimension of love, which for me has been a major element of my own practice and is very centered in um, all the great wisdom traditions, including secular wisdom traditions, and certainly in the Buddhist tradition, the primacy of love as a practice, not to exhaust ourselves, um, but as a wisdom practice even fundamentally, including the pragmatic wisdom of what's in our own best interest. So you might consider in terms of these four boxes, two by two matrix, of course, high power, low power, high love, low love, bringing more of the dimension of love in. Also consider how you might um, use your power more than you do have. Like I said, if we have power that we're not using through voting, through supporting causes, through sending money, through um, where we put our attention, where we put our thumbs up and thumbs down. We often have a lot more social power. I mean, just 
naming it, the uh, turnout uh, in America for voting is roughly 50% in a presidential election and maybe a little more than that. And then if you move down so-called down ballot into state elections and more local elections, where a lot of really important granular power is exercised, including over the institutions of democracy itself, participation rates start falling off, um, including especially for younger people who have the most um, to gain or lose from how power is exercised because they will inherit the results over a long period of time. So maybe there's power that um, we can exercise that we don't. Okay. In particular, consider how you might skillfully step out of power struggles or prevent them in the first place. For example, um, as a therapist talking to parents, I said, you know, I, that in my view, there are basically four levels of exercising appropriate parental power. Um, <clears throat> what a surprise. I have a four-step system. Level one, you think it, you don't say a word. You think to yourself, my kid has a test tomorrow and I'm watching him just continue to play Nintendo. And But you know, there's going to be a little feedback for them if they don't do very well on that test. Or maybe I'm going to learn a lesson that they actually got it handled. I'm going to keep my mouth shut. You think it, your, your kid walks out the door and they're like, whoa, they're dressed in a really wild way, but for whatever reason you think, or you look at their bedroom and you go, total chaos, you know, this is like an environmental protection agency toxic dump site, but I'm not going to say a word, all right? You think it, you don't say it. Level two, you say it and then you disengage. You make the observation like, honey, I think there's mold growing in your closet and you know, there's some health risks there. And then you just stop talking. I, I told you my friend Daniel has an acronym that he learned from his friend Chris, Christopher Germer, I think. Um, W-A-I-T, wait, why am I talking? Or waste, why am I still talking? So that's one thing to keep in mind. So level two, you say it and then you disengage. Level three, you persuade. So you openly persuade while leaving it to the other person to choose. You're an advisor. You're a persuader, but you're not a decider. So you say to your, your kid or this other person, look, I'm going to I'm gonna tell you why I think. I'm going to take a minute here and tell you why I think X is. You ought to do X or you ought to stop doing Y. And then after that, it's up to you. I'm not going to get into a big argument about it. I mean, you know, respect your choices, but this is what I really think. Okay. And then level four. We insist. And sometimes insisting uh, with adult adult relationships is kind of along the lines of, you know, I'm going to insist in the frame of if you do X, I will do Y. It's not that I'm threatening you. It's that I'm just saying, if you keep drinking, I'm going to hang up the phone or whatever. If you keep yelling at me, I'm going to hang up the phone. Or if, you know, you call and you're drunk, I'm not going to talk to you. Or if you are not faithful in this ostensibly monogamous relationship, I'm going to leave it almost certainly. You know, I'm reserving my rights in that regard. So that's a form of unilaterally exercising control, uh, at least over what you can do yourself. So these are examples of being clear about exercising power and stepping out of um, situations in which we're exercising power, but it's not producing a good result. And in fact, it's irritating the other person who's tired of our exercise of power in the form of criticism or nagging uh, or monitoring coming at them. Think about that. Another beneficial reduction of power is to clarify from the outset that you're not trying to control anyone. For example, naming your role as an advisor, not a decider, which I'm doing right now in a situ organization I'm involved with. Um, I'm, they're interested in my advice, but I'm really clear, you, you all decide. Uh, and which gives me a lot more freedom to, you know, opine. Uh, another uh, piece of this here is if you have socially acquired higher status, as I do in many settings, we can deliberately step back and not exercise power we have to enable others to step forward, to foreground others who've been pushed to the side 
for far too long. Or in simple, sincere ways, we can be more human and vulnerable. And um, not come in with such throw weight and in fact, you know, kind of downplay our own throw weight in part, not manipulatively, but sincerely by being human and vulnerable. These are ways that we can reduce our power beneficially alongside ways that I've talked about increasing the dimension of love. And then last, what does it feel like when power, when we do assert it, is infused with love? It's not separated from love. It's an expression of love, right? Fueled by principle, the expression of a, of a fearless caring, perhaps. Um, what's that feel like? In what areas in your life do you do that, that you can name and know as an example for you? You know, where the assertion of power, the expression of power feels just, and it feels like as if you're lived by a powerful current moving through you into the world, a, a current that is powerful, that at its heart is infused with love. You could think of examples of that, or maybe just talking about it now inspires you to feel your way into that more in an important relationship or an, imp or an important undertaking or project. Um, here to borrow some phrasing from Pure Land Buddhism, which has arisen primarily in Japan over the last some hundreds of years, actually, and about which I don't know that much, so I don't want to presume here at all. But I'm aware of the distinction that's sometimes drawn in that tradition, so I'm um, honoring it or respecting it or acknowledging it by naming it here. Um, a shift from what could be called self-power to other power. In other words, a shift from willpower or my power or you know, I'm doing it, to a feeling that it's almost as if an other of one kind or another is moving through you and you're an expression of that power. Perhaps uh, in that tradition, a supernatural in some ways or transcendental energy or consciousness of a kind of Buddha consciousness or Buddha energy that's, that's universal. Or more broadly, um, and generally, we can under, understand this as your innate goodness is that other power moving through you. Or nature. A few weeks ago, I talked about returning from spending a month in the wild, much more rock climbing and camping and hiking, and um, feeling like it's nature or life moving through you. What might that feel like? Or a higher wisdom or a powerful, unwavering love. I mean, you can consider important goals or aims that you have. What might it feel like to pursue them? I really encourage you to ask yourself this. What might it feel like to pursue them carried along by wholesome forces, including love, so that a river or wellspring or current, an updraft uh, of wonderfulness is powerfully moving through you toward wholesome aims. What difference might it be if you felt this in how you act, or in your tone of voice, in how you carry yourself, um, in how you operate or behave in meetings or in difficult conversations, if you feel like you're, you're carried along by love through, as you express yourself assertively? And how might you feel about yourself along the way, if that were the case? So how about this? I'll be quiet for about a minute, and I really encourage you to reflect on this. And focus on anything that, you've, that really stands out for you. One or two takeaways, at least, from what we've talked about here.
Okay. So I've started to read through the chat. Um, you can trust that I will have received what you've written. Um, and even if I'm not able to respond to it right now. Um, well, I see a couple of people. Um, and I think I'm going to, so I'm going to call on you, Lynn. I'm going to try to get to you, Elaine. I think I may have spoken with you previously, but I'm, so here we are, Lynn, Lynn Harbaugh. I'm asking you to unmute. Great. Um, and please be succinct, focused, all the rest of that as we wrap up here. Thanks, Rick. This is great. Um, I'm thinking about a couple of things. One is the power to help people. Um, and I have this feeling sometimes that I can just do it, but that I'm totally just not, it's not me. It's, and just an example of that is I had these little cards made up during the pandemic, business size cards that said, thank you for working during the pandemic. And then I had a pair of wings with a heart. And then it said, you are an angel. Oh, thank you. And do you have a question in this? Yes, I do. No, so I asserted power right there, but hopefully in a in a good cause. So that's an example of me using power to do good for someone else. My question is, I can't seem to do it for myself. Ah, I'm so glad, Lynn, you named that. Yeah. That's the question. How do I do it for me? Yeah, that's huge. Well, I think that's where we start is I've written a lot about this, the topic of and talked getting on your own side, right? Being a friend. I read something, being loyal to yourself the other yeah. day. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Be loyal to yourself. Um, I'll tell you three things you can do from a practical standpoint. And I encourage you to exercise the power you can to light the pilot light. And then having lit the pilot light, with these three practices, to, by deciding to do them, then you can engage these practices, which will light a fire for you. First one, understand why it is moral and okay to exercise power for yourself. Just to recognize why it's actually principled and okay to be on your own side, to be an ally or a friend to yourself like you are to others because very often people have beliefs that it's not okay. They're not allowed to do that. It's a sin, it's vain, it goes against their gender socialization or anything, their culture, their religion, their family. Um, why is it fair? Fair for you to step up for yourself, okay? Second, um, know what it's like to be loyal to another person or for another person and then try to apply that attitude. Know what it's like in your body to yourself. That's really helpful, all right? Third thing is to um, really take in the good of feeling cared about by others. Look for the evidence of it in the present or the past. Try to help the knowing that you're cared about to become a feeling of being cared about. And then when you start to have that feeling, slow down and take in the good, let it sink in. And as we internalize again and again, feeling cared about by others and, and worthy in their eyes, we can gradually start feeling um, more worthy ourselves and more, more entitled in a healthy way to take care of ourselves, to stand up for ourselves, to exercise power for ourselves. Those three suggestions. Yay, Are, thank you. Yeah, are you willing to go for it? I am. All right. All right. So I want you to come next week and send me a chat. You can do it privately. So I'm exercising power in my role as a teacher to try to make you accountable here. So when you come, okay. I might and wear if, a disguise because it'll be hard. Yeah, that's right. That's right. I, and, and if you come back and say, Rick, great ideas, I just couldn't do it. I'm like, all right, great. You told me. Tell the truth. That's great. And then we'll go just from there. One okay, of them. good. All right. Thanks, Lynn. All right, I think Thank I you. have time. Yep. So Krista, I'm going to call on you and then I promise I will get to you, Elaine. So a promise is a kind of exercise of power. Great, Krista, you've unmuted yourself. Great. Okay, and I apologize in advance. I live out in the country. So if I have a delay, that's why. Um, so no my worries. question has to do with, um, as a child, I definitely had little to no power um, in our 
family system. And I noticed um, how that affected my ability to, um, well, not having the ability to create confidence and how that you know, grew an anxiety around just having basic skills. And once I got out of the house, it's like, oh shit, I have no skills, you know, I can't do this and I'm very anxious and not confident. So my question is, um, how, how is the power that we're talking about related to the idea of agency? Yeah. Do, do you know what I'm yep. getting at? Yeah, it's very related. I mean, agency is an exercise of power. I mean, whether it's over the object world, like I'm exercising agency to grab my water bottle, or <clears throat> I exercised agency to, you know, in, just to kind of interrupt Lynn, hopefully it, you know, for good purpose. Uh, but yeah, agency is central. And it, maybe you're already aware of it kind of as a context here. We're so vulnerable to acquiring learned helplessness. Do you know about this material there, Krista? It's really worth learning about. Um, learned helplessness, a sense of futility, defeat from the get-go. And we're very vulnerable to that. So that's why it's really important, especially you know if you belong to a group or were raised in a culture in which you're kind of hemmed in, controlled, boxed in, denied, you know, voiceless, taking someone's voice away from them. Children are to be seen and not heard. Boom, enormous exercise of power. When the military takes over a country, what's the first thing they do? They grab the TV stations. You know, they want to control the voice uh, of the people. Uh, so yeah, so reclaiming power in all kinds of ways, agency is really important. Look for ways to reclaim efficacy and agency, starting in small ways and then building out. Did that, do you want to say more? I didn't mean to cut you off. I'm just hopping on board your comment about agency. No, I guess the only other thing I would say is just that um, it was interesting when you asked the first question about, you know, uh, exercising power, I realized that I only think of the term power as in the abuse of power. <laughs> I mean, that's my initial, you know, it's like, oh, well, that's interesting. What does that mean? You know, um, and that it seems, can you speak to the pattern of, like, I remember as a kid turning around and uh, treating my younger sister the way I was being treated because I had no other outlet, you know? Yeah. That kind of transferring that and, and how that becomes maybe community globally an issue or is, is that part of our problem altogether? Well, so much in what you're saying there and, and um, yeah, you look at social structures, uh, <laughs> Mistreatment rolls downhill, <laughs> you know, whether it's in a junior high school cafeteria, right, or, you know, in social structures with immigrants and so forth. Um, with regard to the broader point that I really want to pick up on, and then I want to move move on to Elaine, uh, so I'm going to exercise my power to do that, uh, is uh, the notion initially that power means abuse of power. And it's so interesting, like uh, to give you kind of an extreme example, uh, when uh, you know we go see a doctor or a professional, there's a differential of power, but we're including expertise power, okay? I went to see a dentist uh, the other day, yesterday, because I need a root canal. And I don't, I don't mind, and this fellow has done two root canals before and it was all good, so no worries. Hope, anyway. When I go in to see that person, there he is going to exercise tremendous power over me. He's going to stick needles in my mouth, going to numb me, going to put me in a chair, going to tell me not to move, going to do all kinds of stuff. And I want him to. I want him to exercise that power on my own behalf. Now, obviously, as soon as there's a power differential, that's I, for me, as soon as there's a differential of power, there is a moral responsibility toward those we have greater power than, in my strong view. I have a strong view about that, all right? And um, how we exercise that responsibility, including at social scales, depends on the details, but basically we have a duty. We have a duty of care. Whether you're a therapist, a parent, a dentist, a wealthy person, 
person of privilege and advantage. You have a duty of care toward those that you have more power than, in my strong view. See for yourself whether you think that's true. But we can exercise that duty of care justly and benevolently. Um, the Buddha was quite clear. <laughs> he exercised power in various ways, um, including pushing, eventually pushing, partly because his mother uh, exercised power toward him to persuade him to um, ordain female monastics in his profoundly patriarchal culture of the time. And he pushed back against the male monastics who didn't want him to do it. So he, you know, he's willing to exercise social power for the force of good. So, you know, my hunch maybe, uh, just kind of a guess, is that lots and lots of people, maybe this fits for you, um, feel a little ashamed or guilty about exercising power. And then, again, the reasons why this happens, exercise it covertly. Aha. Or in roundabout ways, we hint, we use euphemisms rather than just coming out with straight up persuasion or insisting. Like, well, you know, do what you do, but I'm telling you, you do that again, I'm going to do this. Right? So that's very interesting. How do people who, and again, sometimes we don't, people who are mistreated or, you know, under the thumb, they don't have a choice. So they, they find, effective ways to exercise the power that they have, often by placating those who are powerful and kind of working around them in various ways. And you know, look, to overgeneralize, I'm sure, but to look at history, that's been the what women have been supposed to do over the years. And a lot of women have just had it up to here with that, understandably. You know, I respect that. So it's interesting to look at this. And there might be that there are ways to exercise power more explicitly rather than implicitly or even covertly, and also ways to feel entitled and head high um, to exercise power in causes that are just. And you decide what's just. <laughs> my general point of view is stick it to the man. <laughs> anyway, that comes from my youth. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Krista. All right, Elaine, I'm gonna ask you to unmute. I will, pro I will finish up in three minutes. I will only go 10 minutes late. Yeah. For us, just a comment on that. I'd say first, you know, harm is a real yeah. to, to think about with people who have a lot of power. Um, yeah. I, I want to go back to something very early that you said that, that, that raised a couple. Well, we we'll try to stick to one question. But you said about the parent um, and the, the kids with the knives, right? And you deflect that desire. And what immediately came to mind is like, oh, suffering. Here's this being who has a desire and that's being deflected. On the other hand, it might be saving the kid's life. You learn to have preferences, right? So prefer having the ability to have preferences and not be attached to any specific thing would be the opposite of suffering. But I'm also, not exactly the opposite, but, but help toward alleviating suffering, right? If you don't get that, you can get something else and it'll be fine also. But on the other hand, I'm also thinking like, you could have a lot of trouble making decisions because, well, this is all right and that's all right and that's all right and it all sort of equal, I really don't know what I want because if your background is kind of deflecting what you really want it can become really difficult to know what it is that you want let me throw is that your one. question how to what yes, to do when you I just just want to throw in one additional thing if i may about jane goodall because i heard a story she was talking about how she was raised and her mom she, you know she could take bugs and mud in her bed because her mom totally respected you know, that she had this fantastic interest about creatures and little creatures in nature. So it wasn't like, don't take this dirt into the house and don't take this hurt into the bed, this dirt into the bed, you know, which is kind of like the whole opposite of like you deciding as a parent and have that power and say, no, this is right and this is wrong. And I'm going to tell you what you like. Um, I'm not totally sure what the question is, but I, I think about your, the preferences and about being deflected from figuring out your own yeah, wants yeah. And, and how good is that and how bad is that? Well, I, so if I get you right, I think there are two levels to this question and it's it's a really important um, 
to secure. Hang on one second. Um, so it is interesting, isn't it, that at a deep level, there's tremendous wisdom in the saying that the great way is easy for one with no preferences. And as a kind of um, profound practice, including a meditation, to rest in a mind of no preference on the one hand. On the other hand, as biological creatures, we have preferences, like for example, to take the next breath or to drink water when thirsty, it's okay. You know, we have preferences that are more subtle uh, that have to do with relationships and friend, you know, those we love. So, you know, this is where I think the Buddha made a very useful distinction between, I'll call it wholesome and unwholesome aims, and then pursued with wholesome and unwholesome means with or without attachment to the results. So the, the, for me, it's kind of helpful to have these three little guidelines. Uh, you know, wholesome aims. Are my purposes virtuous? Are they just? Are they reasonable? You know, even if I'm pursuing my own interests in ways that, you know, competitively with others in an open and fair competitive environment, like 100 applicants for a job, you know, if I win, they will lose. But still, I'm, I'm, it's a reasonable aim to get this job. And am I pursuing it virtuously? Am I telling the truth on my resume, right, or lying about it? Am I cheating to get this interview? Am I pursuing it reasonably? And then last, whatever happens, can I be at peace with the result? I mean, that I think is a really useful way to look at it. Also, then, then the last one really gets at what's our relationship to desire. The Buddha did not teach that desire is inherently a problem. He taught that craving in the sense of contracted insistence, saturated typically with a sense of self. Yeah, <laughs> take a look. <laughs> that tends to create suffering and harm, right? In ways subtle and gross. So um, we can have our preferences. We can long for true love, right? And the question is, can we long for true love and feel that and have a passion for it and support ourselves down that road of pursuing it without getting contracted around it and insistent and craving around it. Or when we, as usual, notice that we've gotten a little craving saturated, wisdom starts to come back in. So I would just, maybe I'll just leave it there. Okay, I think that's, thank you. that's my yeah, best crack. Thank oh, thank you. I really appreciate it, Elaine. And um, if you're the Elaine that you are the Elaine, you're a frequent contributor in the chat and I appreciate what you write. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay, good. Well, this covered a lot of ground. I hope that uh, me going after these kind of fundamental topics, themes, so forth is not too boring. And I look forward to seeing you next week. It'll be good. Okay. So if you want to stick around and talk with some people in a small group for 20, 30 minutes, maybe about this, um, stick around. And then my friend Art will sort people. Uh, into these various uh, groups in Zoom. Otherwise, it's time to wave goodbye and push that red leave button at the bottom of your Zoom window so you're not here when we start sorting people into these breakout rooms, uh, which, and if you're still here in Zoom, it gets kind of confusing. Okay, so you all take care. I definitely will have uh, read all the chat before I go to bed tonight and probably long before. And I'm gonna turn this over now to my friend, the excellent writer, and noble spirit, Art, Art Yord. Okay, take your care, you all. See you next week. All right, bye-bye.